welcome everyone to the 2021 ANU Japan Update, uh, which is presented to you by the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, I'm delighted today to have, um, to officially open the Japan Update, um, Professor Helen Sullivan, who has recently been appointed Dean of the ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, as many of you know, Professor Helen Sullivan is a world leading political scientist and her research examines several key issues that are vital for our democracy, um, including the theory and practice of governance and collaboration, new forms of democratic participation and public policy and service reform. And as many of you will be aware, for the past few years, Professor Sullivan um, has done a wonderful job as director of the Crawford School of Public Policy here at ANU. And prior to uh, coming to ANU, she was founding director of the Melbourne School of Government at the University of Melbourne. Um, thank you very much, Helen, for joining us today and ha handing over to you now. Thank you so much, Lauren. And um, hello and welcome to everybody uh, joining us uh, from wherever you are. I'm watching the participant numbers climb as I speak, and it's, it's uh, so wonderful to be able to, to welcome everybody to this um, uh, ninth uh, Japan update. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and indeed airways uh, we meet today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, and also extend those respects to any other Indigenous participants who are with us today from wherever you are. Um, it's, as I say, my pleasure to, to welcome everyone to this uh, this year's Japan Update online, uh, the ninth in the update series. But of course, our college's uh, experience with um, uh, Japan is, is extensive and goes right back to um, the, the founding of the university. So while uh, this series kicked off in 2013, uh, we've hosted many conferences and events on Japan uh, in the decades before. So as I say, the ANU's research and engagement work on Japan dates back to the founding of the university 75 years ago this year, uh, with work on Japan at the forefront of our broader Asia engagement. That work continues today, led by the Australian Japan Research Centre, uh, extraordinarily ably led by Dr. Shira Armstrong. Uh, now in its 40, 41st year, um, I must stress that uh, Shiro hasn't led it for the whole of those 41 years. Um, and the Japan Institute, uh, which is equally ably managed by uh, Dr. Lauren Richardson. And it is wonderful that they are uh, co-convening this uh, event today. Now, our commitment as the National University to uh, Japan, uh, to Asian research is, is really important in the current context where other centers of, of Asian research are being cut back across the university sector, um, right at the time when we really do need more knowledge and understanding of our own region and also to um, double down on engagement with our partners there. And, the College of Asia and the Pacific in the National University has become much more important in this context, both as a place for students, which is absolutely why we exist, but also providing the space, the career pathways and the support for academics to work in our region. The college hosts the largest number of Asia specialists in any academic institution in the English speaking world. And that's an asset both for our country and beyond, and one that we really do need to invest in further. And part of my role as Dean of the college is to uh, seek and secure an advocate for uh, that investment. Japanese continues to be the most popular in our suite of language programs and our research on Japan continues to thrive, as is evident from uh, the, the great uh, panels that we have in the update today. We'll hear today how Japanese society is being shaped by the coronavirus pa pandemic, how science, defense, and technology policies are changing Japan, and also about the governance challenges the country faces. You'll hear some of ANU's research in the panels and insights from our speakers in Japan. I'm delighted to launch this year's East Asia Forum quarterly issue on Japan, Confronting Crisis in Japan, edited by Ricky Kent Kirsten, Honorary Professor at the AJRC and ANU, and Ben Ascoin, who's recently finished his PhD with a ANU and is now at one of Japan's top universities, Waseda. 
I'd also like to take the opportunity to foreshadow a major report that Shiro Armstrong from the AJRC is leading on reimagining the Japan relationship that's due out later this year. The Japan update brings us together to help understand what's going on in Japan and is part of an ongoing body of work at the ANU. And I hope you can keep in touch with that through the various newsletters, seminars, and events to which you'll be linked to during the update. Um, and do keep an eye on the chat uh, because a number of, of links are, have already been put up and I know that uh, there'll be lots uh, going on, um, on in the sidebar, as it were, as well as in the main event. This was to be a hybrid event with an in-person audience and there was a lot of work that went into preparing for that and I would like to thank everybody involved in the preparation of these events. I know that a great deal of work goes on behind the scenes to make them work as well as they can. Um, while we couldn't do the hybrid event, I'm so pleased that under the circumstances we are uh, able to transition seamlessly uh, into a fully online event. We are becoming uh, very adept at, at moving from one uh, media to another these days. So as I say, I'm very pleased to open this year's update and I will now pass on to Ipe, uh, one of my other past colleagues from, from Crawford, to begin with the proceedings. Thank you all. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Helen. Um, I'm still the present uh, you know, colleague of yours still, so that I just wanted to say that. But okay, so that, anyway, so the, welcome to the keynote session. I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of economics here at the ANU and the Keio University in Tokyo. So uh, we first acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and uh, pay our respect to the elders past and the present. And uh, okay, so it is our great pleasure to welcome Professor Yasuki Sawada as the keynote speaker to the Japan Update 2021. Sawada-san is a professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Tokyo. Until very recently, actually until the end of last month, Sawada-san was the chief economist at the Asian Development Bank and was in charge of ADB's economic outlook and economic research. And the Sawada-san's key research areas are uh, development economics, uh, microeconometrics, the economics of disasters and the field of surveys and experiments. And uh, what I admire the most about the Sawada-san is that uh, he always put himself in the shoes of those who are suffering due to, for example, poverty, disasters, and so on and I conduct the research to find out the causes of their suffering and what can be done about it. Economists, unfortunately, including myself, tend to analyze topics that are intellectually interesting rather than relevant to reality. Sabada-san is steadfast in his pursuit of what is essential, but at the same time, many of them open up the frontiers in academic research. Sabada-san always remind me of what it is to be a social scientist. I can continue for next 30 minutes or more to talk about how I have been impressed by Sabada-san, but I know uh, you would like to listen to the keynote speech as soon as possible. And uh, during the, the Sabada-san's speech, if you have any questions to keynote speech, please post them at the chat functions. I would like to ask the question Sabada-san after his presentation. So without a further ado, please join me in welcoming Sawada-san. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very warm introduction, uh, Dean uh, Helen Saliban-san, and also uh, Ippe Fujiwara-san. Thank you for a very, very nice and warm introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, um, greetings from Metro Manila, the Philippines, where I, I'm now. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, joining. And also, I'd like to thank um, uh, Shiro, Shiro san, and uh, also Ipia san for having me uh, arranging uh, uh, today's uh, lecture. Um, so, little background it's clear uh, COVID 19 pandemic uh, is a main challenge facing Japan, Asian region, and also all the global uh, society and economy today. Uh, vaccines now give a hope uh, we can gradually uh, turn the tide of pandemic and uh, rebuild for a strong recovery. But um, um, we are not uh, still um, uh, out of woods yet. Uh, we must focus our uh, efforts now uh, so that recovery can be lasting, long-lasting, uh, available, to, available to 
everyone and including the poorest and most vulnerable in our uh, societies. So uh, my presentation in next uh, 25 minutes or so uh, will be composed of three parts. Uh, first, um, uh, you may wonder uh, about the uh, Asian Development Bank, in short, ADB. So um, the first part is a um, brief introduction of ADB. Uh, secondly, updating Japan's uh, recovery uh, situation. And also um, uh, Asian, third part is about uh, Asia's uh, economic uh, outlook. Thank you. So please uh, move on to the next uh, slide. So next slide um, uh, is an uh, overview of uh, Asian uh, Development Bank. Uh, can you kindly go to the next slide? So um, Asian Development Bank, um, ADB, in short, ADB was uh, founded in 1966, so uh, more than 50 years. Uh, a few years ago, we celebrated the 50 years. Yes, uh, this is right. Uh, 50 years um, anniversary a few years ago. Uh, uh, and ADB has served as the Asia and Pacific's uh, lending regional development bank. Um, from um, uh, 31 members at the establishment in 1966, ADB has grown to encompass 68 members, of which 49 are from, uh, and, uh, from Asia and Pacific, and 19 outside the region, including uh, European uh, countries as well as uh, North American country, Canada and the United States. Uh, ADB headquartered in Metro Manila, where I'm now uh, based. Um, uh, ADB provides a strong and reliable finance to our developing members, a practical knowledge solution and partnerships among the uh, range of stakeholders. And um, so basically ADB not only providing uh, uh, loans and uh, uh, financing instruments to our member countries, um, uh, developing member countries in Asia and Pacific, but also we provide uh, knowledge product like um, uh, my uh, research uh, uh, department and also uh, uh, policy guidance, pol policy dialogue. And also uh, one particular uh, uh, nature of ADB, ADB not only support uh, each individual uh, developing member uh, countries and economy, but also a group of uh, countries together we support, which is called the regional cooperation integration. Um, one example is uh, uh, countries around the uh, Mekong River we have been um, uh, doing um, uh, uh, celebrated the uh, Greater Mekong Subregion uh, program uh, soon after the um, uh, political instability in um, Mekong River region uh, stabilized in 1980, uh, uh, 1990. And ADB has um, uh, more than 3,000 staff members, and uh, one third is about, uh, about one third uh, international staff. Please move on to the uh, next uh, slide. Uh, so I said um, uh, uh, 68 members, nine, 49 are from region. So you can see um, ADB region members covering uh, from uh, Central Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and also Pacific uh, uh, Island countries. Out of 49 members, Japan, uh, Australia, Australia, Japan, and New Zealand, uh, uh, from the beginning, um, um, uh, kind of donor uh, uh, members, uh, not the recipient uh, members. So 46, um, um, so rest 46 um, economies are called the developing uh, member economies or in short DMC. Um, but out of 46, um, uh, Taipei, China, Hong Kong, China, Brunei, uh, Dar es Salaam, Singapore, and Korea, um, they are no longer recipient uh, countries. So th this is ADB uh, regional members. Please move on to the next um, uh, slide. So for this uh, today's uh, Japan um, uh, update, I think it's relevant to uh, 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 point out Japan has been a uh, number one uh, contributor uh, in terms of uh, ordinary capital resources, which provides the funding or concessional regular or concessional funding and loans program, but also uh, Asia Development Fund, which is uh, basically um, a grant uh, uh, resources. Japan is a top uh, contributor. And uh, international staff, um, I said uh, um, uh, uh, around one third of uh, 3,600, uh, 1,300 uh, international staff, um, uh, about 10%, uh, 140 are Japanese. And um, uh, actually Japanese share is the largest and uh, uh, together with the United States. So I think uh, this is a, uh, uh, somewhat uh, peculiar. Um, uh, uh, ADB is uh, one of the very few international organization in terms of um, uh, financial contribution and also staffing, uh, Japan play a very important role. Please and, uh, move on to the next slide. 
So uh, next slide, the organizational chart. So president uh, is um, uh, current president, the Mr. Uh, uh, Masatsugu Asakawa, um, uh, who used to be the um, uh, deputy finance uh, minister of um, uh, Minister of Finance of Japan. And he joined uh, last year, uh, just before COVID-19 pandemic, February last year. And um, uh, so, so I, I was uh, in charge of uh, economic uh, research and the regional cooperation um, uh, department, in short ERCD, which is the um, uh, research arm of uh, Asian Development Bank. And I just re uh, retired from ADB uh, uh, end of uh, August. So next uh, slide um, uh, shows the um, uh, ADB operations. So last year we uh, made a financial ADB made a financial commitments uh, 31.6 billion um, uh, US dollars, uh, quite sizable uh, commitment. Um, left is um, uh, by country disaggregation and um, uh, right is uh, sector composition. So we can see um, in Asia, uh, large countries uh, such as India, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, PRC, are the uh, uh, large um, uh, clients of ADB. Uh, right side shows the uh, sector uh, disaggregation of year 2020. Uh, last year was a bit peculiar because of uh, COVID-19, many uh, member countries uh, started uh, putting a large scale uh, financial, um, uh, uh, I mean, fiscal policies um, uh, to support um, uh, people and also businesses. So naturally ADB support of our, uh, our member countries shifted uh, from the uh, infrastructure funding to uh, uh, budget support. So that's why uh, last, last year, a little peculiar, public sector management, public sector support uh, are the largest uh, component. Uh, next um, uh, slide uh, shows the more uh, balanced the, um, uh, our support. Uh, so this is outstanding loans covering uh, last, um, uh, even last um, a couple of decades uh, uh, loan, loans program. By country, again, big countries, India, China, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, Philippines, uh, our uh, very important uh, clients. By sector transport is about the quota. So I think uh, this is the um, uh, uh, ADB's uh, uh, pre uh, COVID 19 operation. About one quarter uh, of resources devoted into transport sector, um, uh, especially metro and uh, railway programs in uh, big cities, uh, road uh, and port uh, uh, support uh, 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 programs and projects. And also energy sector uh, play a, a very important role in supporting a renewable energy shift in Asia and Pacific region. And the uh, next slide is the final slide for um, uh, ADB. Uh, ADB uh, adopted um, uh, strategy 2030 two years ago for the next 10 years um, uh, strategy up until 2013. Uh, ADB set the seven priority areas, including uh, uh, poverty, uh, gender, um, uh, disaster resilience and climate change, um, urbanization, um, uh, and also uh, rural and agriculture, governance support and regional cooperation and uh, integration. So uh, par particularly ADB has been um, uh, supporting um, um, uh, gender uh, uh, mainstreaming and also um, uh, energy sectors uh, uh, shift uh, and climate change, supporting uh, mitigation and also adaptation. So, so this is the end of the first part about the uh, ADB. So please uh, move on to the second slide. So second part, uh, I'd like to um, uh, discuss Japan's uh, recovery situation so far, as well as the uh, forecast uh, this year and next, next year based on Asian development outlook. And the Asian Development Outlook is um, uh, ADB's uh, flagship uh, publication um, uh, focusing on the growth forecast, inflation forecast, and uh, broader economic uh, outlook. So next slide, please. Um, so ADB's uh, Asian Development Outlook um, uh, forecast, uh, basically we focused on developing member uh, countries, as I mentioned, 46 uh, member countries. Uh, but uh, in order to make uh, 46 uh, developing member uh, countries and economies and members uh, econ focus, we need to set the global uh, 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 assumptions and global um, uh, uh, economic uh, outlook. So, so this is a, a table summarizing, um, particularly we uh, uh, track uh, group of three, United States, Euro area, and Japan. So this is basically our ADO uh, 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 assumptions. And uh, overall outlook for major advanced economies listed here, um, uh, group of three countries, 
recovery in U.S. and Euro area uh, seems to be on uh, track, uh, uh, setting aside the um, uh, ongoing uh, uh, Delta variant um, uh, recurrence. Uh, these economies uh, continue to reopen, uh, basically. In Japan, however, new waves of COVID-19 infections in the first half of uh, this year, 2021, have hurt the uh, economy, uh, prompting a downgrade to uh, 2021 growth forecast. So, um, um, so renewed the COVID-19 pandemic waves have a delayed recovery in Japan. Uh, economies, uh, however, economy is expected to rebound in second half of 2021 and throughout 2022 as the current wave of infection uh, recedes and also vaccines uh, roll out accelerate. We see some sign, uh, a little bit some sign of uh, um, uh, receding a current wave of uh, infections uh, in last a few days. Um, as I, I will show you um, just uh, um, uh, uh, in a minute, um, uh, manufacturing PMI uh, percent manager index remain in expansional territory in Japan. And industry production machinery orders have uh, bounced back in recent months. So GDP growth forecast for Japan 2021, uh, we slightly uh, revised down from uh, April forecast to uh, latest uh, July forecast from 2.9% to 2.6%, um, but mirrored by upgrade for 2022, 2.4% uh, 2 uh, 2022 uh, forecast in April, we now upgraded to 2.7%. Uh, um, uh, uh, percent. By the way, uh, July uh, forecast the latest I can share with you, and uh, September 2022, 20, uh, uh, in two weeks, uh, we will release uh, ADO updates. Um, uh, so uh, uh, if you're interested, please join our webinar uh, for uh, Agent Development Out Outlook uh, Updates um, uh, 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 webinar. So please move on to the ne next uh, slide. Uh, next slide uh, shows the uh, overall um, movement of uh, uh, GDP uh, since um, uh, Q1 2019 uh, uh, up until uh, uh, Q2 uh, 2021. Uh, as a contraction of 7.1% uh, in Q1 uh, 2021, last two uh, bar charts uh, right end shows the um, uh, Q1 Q2 uh, 2021. So uh, Q1 was not good, um, uh, minus 3.7%, um, uh, and surging COVID-19 cases uh, and increased uh, re restriction dampened the uh, uh, private consumption. Uh, uh, but the Q2, uh, Japanese economy um, uh, rebounded uh, uh, slightly, 1.3%, positive 1.3% growth in Q2. Uh, this rebound was uh, driven uh, largely by consumption, which grew by 3.4%, uh, effectively offsetting a decline in Q1. Also, we, we show the uh, disaggregation in bar chart. Uh, uh, red one is a private consumption. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but um, uh, uh, Q2 uh, recovery can be attributed to uh, consumption uh, growth. Um, consumption um, uh, growth uh, came despite the uh, state of emergency across uh, Japan in May and June, suggesting consumers may be adapting uh, uh, to the uh, restrictions, physical restrictions. Uh, vaccination rollout have uh, uh, also played a role. Roughly 36% of population now or more uh, uh, are vaccinated and recent restrictions uh, look to have had a smaller impact on uh, mobility. Uh, growth was supported by private investment, uh, which grew by 3.4%. Uh, public investment meanwhile contracted by 5.7% contraction. Export grew uh, 12%, um, quite um, a strong um, recovery of export we observed. Uh, however, uh, this was outpaced by a 21-22% growth in imports. So as a result, net export effectively uh, weighted down uh, economic growth. So, but uh, I would say uh, this is an indication of recovery. Uh, export strongly um, uh, rebound, partly due to uh, recovery of the global economy, but at the same time, import is very strong uh, because of the recovery. So net export is not necessarily contributed to uh, GDP if we adopt this uh, 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 very basic uh, demand side uh, de decomposition of uh, GDP growth. So please move on to the next slide. Uh, next slide I show um, uh, multiple uh, economic indicators. Uh, uh, industrial production uh, is shown in the blue bars here and the retail, retail sales um, uh, uh, denoted in uh, orange bars in this uh, uh, chart. Um, uh, these uh, indicators have uh, registered uh, volatile growth, as we can see up and down um, this year. 
Uh, but averaging a, a 0.1% and a minus 0.5% month-to-month growth, uh, respectively, from January to May. Uh, contraction in uh, industrial production in May was driven by a large uh, drop in car production due to a global shortage in semiconductor chips. And uh, this seems to be continued. And um, uh, this car production decline was not driven by, it is important to point it, not driven by a uh, demand, but rather uh, from a supply uh, chain uh, bottlenecks, uh, industrial uh, uh, material, uh, uh, semiconductor, uh, 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 you know, supply. Uh, on the other hand, retail sales have uh, dampened by uh, de- uh, deceleration, uh, uh, sorry, declaration of a uh, emer- state of emergency in several uh, prefecture in January and again in April and now. Um, uh, supporting uh, expectation of weak uh, uh, consumption. Uh, leading indicators shows a reasonable uh, for optimism. Um, uh, just uh, consumer uh, confidence, uh, yellow line showing here, uh, uh, reached uh, 37.6. Uh, it's the uh, highest since uh, February 2020. And manufacturing PMI showing a gray line. Um, although seems to be a, a rather flat gray line, but remains in uh, expansionary uh, territory above uh, 50. Uh, uh, threshold. So next slide um, uh, summarizes um, uh, COVID cases and uh, uh, vaccine rollout. As we, we can see from the left chart, Japan's uh, experiencing another uptick in COVID-19 cases after seeing a surge in January and April this year. So uh, can be attributed to uh, Delta uh, variant. And the blue shows the new cases. Um, uh, so if uh, we take um, a really uh, latest uh, figure, I think um, uh, blue uh, should show us some, some type of a uh, tapering uh, shape. A state of emergency was issued for major metropolitan area, including Tokyo and Osaka, and mobility restrictions were imposed on more than uh, 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 10 other prefectures throughout uh, August. Uh, in the right chart, vaccines uh, have been progressing steadily, which, can, uh, uh, which is uh, encouraging amid uh, uncertainty uh, 36% of population are now fully vaccinated. Roughly 48% uh, percent of population have uh, received at least um, uh, one doses of uh, end of uh, July. So this is a little bit um, uh, old uh, figure. Uh, we have a much higher uh, vaccination rate now. Uh, number of deaths looks be uh, decoupling from uh, the rise in uh, cases and uh, largest surge, suggesting that vaccination help uh, prevent infections resulting in serious illness and death. So left chart uh, yellow shows the uh, new, uh, new deaths. Having said this, uh, Delta variant, the recent figures, which is not um, uh, included here, shows the um, uh, 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 increasing in mortality uh, due to COVID uh, is uh, really uh, one uh, 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 serious uh, signs of uh, recovery. So next uh, uh, slide shows the um, uh, 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 Japan's um, uh, trade uh, indicators. Export growth orange looks to be uh, slowing after uh, registering a strong rebound through a second half of last year and early this year. So uh, yellow uh, line is uh, export. The surge in export was driven in large part by uh, solid demand for cars and odd parts from the US, EU, and shipments of semiconductor uh, producing equipment to China. The recent slowdown is more likely due to a, um, a semiconductor chip supply shortages and constraints rather than softening uh, external demand. Meanwhile, uh, imports shown in the gray line here uh, has locked, uh, 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 locked uh, strong uh, uh, growth in recent months, um, uh, gray, char- gray, gray uh, line, due to a rebound in uh, crude oil uh, prices and government purchases of COVID-19 vaccines which have driven up imports of uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide. Uh, so this is a summary of uh, uh, Japan parts. Um, uh, Japan's economy is picking up, uh, but the weaker than expected private consumption in the first half will delay the recovery. Economic activity is expected to rebound in the second half of 2021 and throughout uh, 2022. Uh, our growth forecast, or uh, uh, our uh, basic uh, uh, assumption of uh, Japan forecast, 6.2% for 2021 growth and 2.7% growth in 2022, which is a slight downgrade for 2021 and uh, upgrade for 2022. Uh, if we compare April 2021 uh, forecast, ADO forecast, and uh, uh, July uh, 2021 uh, forecast. Growth will be driven largely by a recovery in private consumption, private investment. Private consumption is expected to pick up 
as more people got vaccinated and thus mobility restrictions are uh, mitigated. Also, uh, since external demand remains strong, as uh, supply chain uh, disruption uh, subsides, private investment is expected to increase as uh, manufacturing keeping up uh, with the strengthening uh, uh, external demand. Uh, inflation is expected to be zero uh, in 2021 before uh, rising gra uh, gradually to 0.5% uh, next year. Developments uh, around the COVID-19 remains the uh, largest risks to the outlook. More COVID-19 outbreaks and uh, renewed lockdown can dampen economic activity as it did earlier this year and now ongoing. Rapid progress on vaccination is a key in decoupling uh, inflation um, uh, uh, of um, uh, cases from hospitalization and uh, uh, deaths. And we will thus be a crucial, uh, vaccination is, will be crucial for enabling uh, resumption in economic activity. So delays to vaccination would be a downside risk. On the other side, a major uh, upside risk is um, a new fiscal package that may be announced in coming uh, months. So this is the um, uh, end of uh, Japan's um, uh, parts. And finally, I'd like to quickly go over uh, uh, Asian parts. Next uh, slide, please. So the um, uh, latest, latest uh, focus uh, outlook of uh, ADB is um, uh, 46 uh, developing members, DMCs. Um, uh, here again, uh, numbers are 46 DMCs within Asian Pacific, um, 49 uh, regional members minus uh, Australia, Japan, and New Zealand. So next slide summarizes the main uh, uh, messages. So uh, first, uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, persists in a number of economies in the region. Vaccination is progressing, but the developing Asia is still far from achieving a hard immunity. Second, recovery paths diverge as export and domestic demand boost growth in some countries, while containment and travel restrictions restrain other uh, uh, members. Thirdly, uh, developing Asia's growth is expected to rebound 7.2% uh, this year, uh, 2021, slightly lower than 7.3% um, uh, 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 April uh, forecast. Um, uh, because of outbreak, affected economies have been uh, downgraded. Uh, growth forecast for next year is 5.3% uh, 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 in April forecast, but now upgraded to 5.4%. Uh, so this is the uh, main um, uh, focus numbers. And then number four, although regional inflation slowed uptick in early 2021, following a steady decline throughout the 2020, inflation will remain benign at 2.4% uh, this year and 2.7% uh, next year. Finally, but not least, the biggest risk to the regional outlook is still pandemic, including a renewed outbreaks and delayed vaccine rollouts. So this is the key messages. And uh, I'd like to um, uh, uh, take a closer look at these issues, uh, some of these issues. So next slide, uh, please. Um, uh, next slide is a uh, COVID um, uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, outlook uh, uh, left chart. Uh, black line shows the um, uh, evolution of new COVID cases in developing Asia since uh, last year. After peaking last September, uh, cases declined steadily through February of this year. But in part because of new variants, the Delta variants and other variants, cases surged uh, in March and April and peaked uh, at uh, 1.7 cases per million people, or around uh, 434,000 cases in total for the region. Um, um, so this has been uh, happening uh, now, up until now. The, uh, the rise was driven uh, largely by South, South Asia first, uh, shown in the red, uh, uh, and then uh, 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 followed by uh, other Asian countries. Now, um, uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines, we are in the middle of uh, resurgence, uh, especially uh, 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 Delta variants. Uh, while cases in South Asia have fallen sh sharply, cases in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, yellow, yellow is the Southeast Asia, Central Asia is blue, and Pacific green. Um, uh, have recently been uh, rising. And also East Asia, we see uh, rising uh, cases. Uh, right chart shows the uh, vaccine rollouts uh, progressing in many uh, economies in Asia and Pacific, but the developing Asia is still far from achieving a hard immunity. As of um, uh, August 12, a little uh, old number, uh, region had administered six, 65 doses per 100 people slightly above a uh, global average of 59, but well below 105 uh, in the United States and 
1992 in uh, Europe. So this is the overall situation of COVID and vaccine rollouts. Vaccine rollouts are progressing, but um, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 a new variants re is really affecting the uh, whole region. So next slide um, um, shows the um, uh, past uh, economic uh, performance. Amid the pa pandemic's uh, up and downs, uh, Asia is experiencing uh, economic uh, revival, uh, though uh, uh, even one. Here, I uh, put the 10 largest uh, economies in uh, uh, Asia, developing Asia. Year-on-year -year GDP growth in Q1 uh, 2021, uh, white dot. Uh, so each, uh, each of 10 uh, largest economies put here, uh, there are two uh, bar charts listed. Left bar chart is uh, last year's uh, growth uh, decomposed uh, from the uh, uh, demand side. And uh, right chart is um, uh, Q1 uh, economic growth 2021, white dots. So yellow dot is the last year's growth and white dot is a Q1 uh, growth in this year. So all of the uh, uh, 10 largest economies, we see uh, recovery from yellow dots last year growth to white dots um, uh, recovery uh, across the board. Uh, 2021 Q1 um, uh, year on year growth was particularly strong up, uh, in um, uh, China, uh, People's Republic of China, shown in the left end is PRC, very strong uh, uh, recovery of uh, white dot. Um, um, uh, uh, so this is the um, uh, notable. And uh, improvements, um, uh, across the board improvements uh, came both from a domestic and external front. Contributions uh, from a private consumption, blue bars, uh, became less negative or turned positive for all 10 economies. Contribution from uh, uh, investment, showing the orange bars, also improved in eight out of uh, 10 economies. External side, net export, gray bars, were bigger a boost to growth in Q1 for several export-oriented um, uh, economies, especially in the middle segments, uh, newly industrial uh, economies, NIES, uh, uh, PRC, Hong Kong, China, Singapore, Taipei, China, uh, gray bar are uh, very strong. Uh, that means um, a global economy uh, recovery really helped the uh, revival of uh, uh, these uh, uh, economies. And the next chart that zoom in a uh, few aspects, uh, recovery continues to be supported by a robust manufacturing revival shown in the left chart. Left chart is uh, PMI um, uh, in um, uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, so uh, big drop in uh, last year, uh, PMI really recovered uh, strongly and um, remain in a positive uh, territory. So still uh, we are in a positive territory and manufacturing is expanding. Um, so, so this is the um, uh, one uh, uh, supply side uh, uh, recovery pattern, and the right chart shows the um, uh, real exports. Um, so this uh, up and uh, upturn in manufacturing showing the left has uh, gone hand in hand with the strengthening uh, uh, trade. Global regional export have rebounded, and uh, as we can see from our right uh, uh, chart, uh, black and green lines uh, uh, for. Uh, 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 global and um, uh, green is a uh, uh, region, Asian uh, region, and uh, but the uh, red line is um, really uh, strongest, uh, which is um, uh, uh, China's export PRC uh, 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 strengthening ahead of the rest of uh, uh, developing Asia, and um, uh, China and also especially uh, other uh, East Asian uh, economies uh, recovery has been driven uh, first by exports of medical supplies and productive protective equipment PPEs. But then uh, electronics uh, products uh, um, probably partly attributed to a uh, stay home uh, restrictions and also uh, work from home uh, arrangement. But uh, exports in the rest of uh, developing Asia have been uh, catching up in recent uh, months, so little lacking behind. Uh, next chart, uh, please move on to the next chart. Next chart. Um, having seen a, a rather rosy uh, picture of uh, of our export. Unlike uh, this uh, rosy picture, tourism still shows a uh, little sign bounce back, as we can see from this chart. This is um, uh, uh, international tourist ar arrival for uh, major economies, major tourist dependent economies in Asia. Uh, tourist ar arrival have uh, remained uh, de depressed since April 2020, as we can see, uh, almost 100% uh, decline or 80% uh, uh, decline. Only a uh, red line, which is a uh, Maldives, uh, shows the um, uh, recovery. Um, Maldives um, uh, opened up um, uh, uh, a country to uh, uh, tourism in last uh, uh, July, July uh, 2020. Even there, tourism arrival is still well below a normal time. 
So uh, these are the really uh, big, uh, still big, severe uh, recession uh, element uh, on the tourism uh, dependent uh, economies. Um, uh, Georgia, Maldives, Thailand, uh, several Pacific Island economies. And next chart. So I Thank, to... Thank you so much for the yeah. fantastic presentation, but could yeah. you wrap up your presentation? Yes, yes. Thank so, you. So I will uh, wrap up. Um, uh, please move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, next slide is overall uh, um, uh, recovery. As I uh, said, um, um, uh, overall, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, move on to the next slide. Yes, uh, so this is the, um, uh, our uh, gross forecast this year and next year. So um, um, uh, this year, 7.2% uh, growth, and uh, uh, next year, 5.4% uh, 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 growth. That's our overall forecast. Green shows the uh, update of our forecast since uh, April up until uh, July. We see uh, East Asia has been uh, really um, uh, recovering well, uh, more than our prior uh, expectation. And then uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia seems to be encountering uh, 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 negative uh, COVID uh, recurrence. So, uh, so this is the uh, quite divergent recovery uh, path of uh, Asian economy. And uh, please move on to the slide 25. Uh, next and uh, next slide. So, inflation um, um, actually skip uh, commodity price um, uh, recovery of uh, gro global economy co commodity and also uh, uh, energy and food uh, 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 indexes. Um, but um, uh, overall inflation seems to be uh, benign and uh, well under uh, control. So uh, this year, 2.4% inflation, uh, next year, 2.7% uh, uh, inflation, which is very below uh, in last uh, few decades uh, inflation. So inflation is under control. And then, um, uh, yes, uh, this is a summary, but key message I uh, just uh, uh, summarized at the beginning. So uh, let me skip this and move on to the uh, next, uh, next slide. So what has been, uh, ADB has been uh, doing? So ADB basically has done uh, two um, major, uh, yes, uh, uh, support. First one is uh, 20 billion uh, comprehensive COVID-19 response package. Uh, main uh, ingredient is supporting uh, uh, budget of our member economy. And then our next slide, um, uh, the final slide, uh, we also supported uh, through um, uh, uh, newly created Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility, APVAX, uh, December, uh, we uh, announced and started 9 billion uh, 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 package to support uh, our member countries access and distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccines because uh, procurement and getting supply is uh, one challenge. Um, uh, uh, financially and also uh, physically. So uh, in order to support this, uh, we um, uh, provided a 9 billion um, uh, 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 newly created AP box uh, uh, facility. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to stop my presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, again. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Ipe-san. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for very comprehensive and uh, insightful presentation that we got the very nice, uh, you know, comprehensive view on Japan and Asia during and after the, the COVID crisis. So we'd like to have uh, questions and the comments, but, uh, you know, the next session is waiting. And uh, luckily, Sawada-san kindly agreed uh, to participate in the next session as a panelist. So the, um, if you have any questions, you, some of you already posted questions at the Q&A, so the, maybe Lauren, the chair of the next session, will pick up the, some of them at the end of the Q&A sessions in her panel. So that, please join me thanking uh, Sawada-san for a fantastic presentation. And uh, now I would like to pass my microphone to Lauren. So Lauren, please. Thank you, Ipe. Um, so I'll be chairing this first panel of the Japan update on the impact of COVID-19 on Japanese society. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, from which we're broadcasting on, uh, the Ngunnawal people, and I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make um, to the life of this city and this region. Um, in last year's Japan update, we looked at many of the macro effects of the pandemic, and we expected that this year in uh, 2021, we would be in a, a kind of recovery mode. Um, as you've heard from the keynote, that's not the case. And the Delta variant um, that really um, took, took hold in Japan and many other countries this year has almost um, resulted in, in a whole new pandemic. 
Um, so in this panel, we'd like to look at the, the kind of shadow pandemics that have emerged from this um, and their impact on Japan. And that includes equality, gender and ageing issues and how um, Japanese society is set to recover um, from this pandemic. Um, so we look at mental health, also suicide effects of COVID-19 and the gaps in the social safety net and progress um, with opening up to immigration. The first panellist today, um, delighted to have Dr. Nana Oishi, um, who's an Associate Professor in Japanese Studies at the University of Melbourne. And um, she completed a PhD in sociology at Harvard. Um, she's done a lot of excellent um, research on topics um, related to migration and, and a variety of other social issues. Um, so thank you, um, uh, Professor Oishi. I'll hand over to you now. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for having me here. And I'd like to first um, like to thank all the organizers um, of ANU for their kind invitations um, extended to me to speak at this great event. Um, today, I'd like to um, talk about COVID-19 and migration in Japan. And uh, my talk um, is going to be structured this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an overview, followed by the impacts of COVID on migrants and the government's support for migrants and the, what kind of remaining challenges they have and what's going to happen in post-COVID Japan. I think this question is something that a lot of us and not just you know, um, in Japan, but on Australia are, are posing, um, or people in other countries all over the world um, are posing. So I'd like to uh, at least comment on this question in the context of Japan. Right, okay. So the, this is the overall like, increase, the trend of migration in Japan. It has been increasing um, since 2012, and um, it hit, um, the highest last year, but it slightly declined due to COVID last year. And this is the, unfortunately, this is the latest stock data that, are, that is available from the Minister of Justice. And the migrants comprise about 2.3% of the, the country's population. It declined slightly, uh, slightly but it's still, um, it's still being, it was still increasing until last year. And however, when you look at the skilled migration flows, you can see that it still increased even in 2020. So that means the number of migrants who enter the country between January and April, when they significantly started closing the door, the border, really was quite huge um, already. So that really shows how many um, companies still want the, uh, the migrants to Japan. And the, so, as I said, the total migrants uh, comprise about 2.3% of the population. But when you look at migrant workers, they comply, uh, comprise 2.5% of the labor force. Um, and it hit the record high um, in 2000, uh, since 2007. So it's been on, on the increasing trend. Um, and their countries of origins um, actually changed last year. Um, it, it, both total migrants for migrant workers in both categories, they always, like, China, like for the last few years or so, China, uh, Chinese people uh, were the biggest group. But last year, uh, Vietnamese replaced Chinese um, in the category of migrant workers. In the to among total migrants, uh, Chinese people are still the biggest, minor uh, majority, um, biggest minority um, or the biggest group in migrants. But uh, when it comes to migrant workers, uh, the Vietnamese are uh, the largest group now followed by Chinese, Filipinos, um, Brazilians, and Nepalese. Right, so as you know, that the border, uh, border has been um, closed across almost all countries in the world due to COVID last year. Um, but in Japan, um, well, Japan too started gradually closing its border uh, since February. Um, in the number of countries that the border closure was extended to began to increase over time. Um, so as of uh, August la uh, last year, um, the border closure was extended to 159 countries and territories. Um, but at the same time, um, in July, uh, the government began to open the, bo um, the border gradually to certain countries. Uh, so they created two, uh, two categories, residence track and um, business track. The residence track is for medium-term uh, medium stayers, um, such as international students or the uh, I'm sorry, not international students, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the workers, temporary workers or medium term workers. So, um, and they started um, sort of 
negotiating with various countries, uh, governments. So the Thailand and Vietnam, um, the Thai, Thais and Vietnamese started coming in in July. And uh, Malaysia, Malaysia, Cambodians, and um, there are several other countries, um, governments concluded the bilateral agreement in September, et cetera. So uh, it was done in a bilateral basis. And a business truck was created uh, for short-term visitors, bis businessmen or businesswoman. Um, and uh, Singapore, Korea, Vietnam, and China uh, were uh, accepted through this truck. Um, in October, um, the border was fully open to all migrants, into, including international students and all visa holders, uh, valid visa holders. However, it was suspended in late December due to the surge in COVID cases. In January to present, uh, migration has been uh, mostly uh, suspended, except uh, spouses and children of Japanese citizens and permanent residents, athletes and Olympics related personnel. Okay, so th this is the flow data um, during the migration of uh, the COVID, uh, COVID time. So um, you can see that the, the, when the border was fully open, you can see like a lot of people started coming in, um, you know, reaching almost 70,000 people coming into Japan just in uh, December, uh, although it declined. And then again, in July, we, had, um, we started having Olympics, so um, more people started coming in as well. Um, so how did the COVID impact uh, migrants? Um, well, you can see that just like Japanese people lost their uh, jobs, a lot of them uh, lost their jobs, um, migrants also did lose their jobs as well. Um, so they faced, a lot of them faced financial difficulties, you know, a lot of them couldn't go home even, if, even though they wanted to because the number of flights was reduced and the airfare became very expensive and even their home country's border was closed. So a lot of them kind of got stranded in Japan and they lost their jobs or they're, uh, they were underemployed, even though they kept their jobs, even the, the employers reduced their hours. So it, was very, it became very difficult for them to, to make their own living. And um, there are a lot of um, civil society organizations in Japan that are providing help for them, um, but it still became more difficult um, to, to reach out to these migrants because of the restrictions, mobility restrictions. Um, even though Japan hasn't really had the huge lockdowns like the ones that we have in Melbourne or Sydney or uh, Canberra, and there is nothing similar to that, but uh, still people are discouraged from moving around um, and a lot of people try to comply. So um, it's, it has become difficult to provide sort of physical um, help people, um, the migrants, helping migrants in person. And also some of the uh, civil society organizations have been having difficulties in um, fundraising um, because it, the donors, their donors also had some economic difficulties due to COVID. So the, the situation has been quite um, challenging for them. But the, the situation, however, um, particularly for temporary migrants, um, the situations for temporary migrants are actually quite good in Japan. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say good, but the, the Japanese government is really trying to provide support um, for temporary migrants. Um, when I say temporary migrants here, I mean non-permanent resident migrants. So those people who are here uh, in Japan as international students or uh, people who have valid work visas um, or investors and so forth, right? Uh, non-permanent resident migrants, okay? So the, the Japanese government basically doesn't really differentiate migrants or non-migrants or like non-Japanese citizens or non-Japanese citizens um, in terms of public support, financial support. So when it comes to COVID-related support, financial packages and so forth, it's quite generous. So when you, when you have a fam migrant family of four, for example, um, each person, each family member gets 100,000 yen uh, which is about 1,200 um, Australian dollars, uh, like it's a lump sum money. So each person gets that. So if you have a family of four, that's like $4,800. Uh, that's quite good. And plus, um, if you are a single parent, you uh, benefit as well. And you can, get, you can apply for small loans. 
um, various support, um, various types of support are available. If you're an international student in Japan, you can also apply for the same uh, COVID cash payment of $100,000 as long as um, they are um, registered as local residents and in the municipalities. And also they have student support emergency payment. Um, they, they can also apply for short-term loans, et cetera. And if you're wor just a worker, if you, um, if you are holding a migrant um, work visa, then you can also apply for special catch payment and you can apply for job seeker equivalent uh, of Australia up to uh, 330,000 uh, yen, which is about almost like $4,000 um, uh, in Australian dollars per month. And they can apply for small loans, reduction of social insurance payments or moratorium of payment, et cetera. Um, so um, they can also get a lot of benefits. If you're a migrant, pro uh, migrant entrepreneur, you can also uh, apply for job keeper equivalent support plus business support packages up to 1 million yen, um, which is about, I'm sorry, this is, I think it's the exchange rate uh, is wrong. Sorry about that. Um, and the rent subsidies and so forth. And even some of Asylum seekers who applied for refugee status um, and staying in the country, they can still up, um, up, they, can, they can still get the cash payment, COVID cash payment, so they're fully covered. Um, so it's quite quite generous. So that's in Australia. I think the if you're a permanent resident, even if you're a migrant, if, as long as you have a permanent resident status, you can um, get that package, uh, job seeker, job keeper, and stuff. But uh, other than that, international students are not covered except in some sort of lump sum cash support from certain government, certain state governments, but other than that, there is no support from the, uh, from the federal government, um, as long as I understand. Okay, uh, as far as I understand. And then, but there are remaining challenges. Uh, the first challenge is um, that irregular migrants are not covered. So all the public support available um, are actually linked to resident, residential uh, status. So um, they have all those people who are registered with uh, local council, local municipalities, are eligible to get those benefits. So those people who are staying in the country on an irregular um, status, then they won't be able to uh, get the support. Uh, that's and they, they are 82,000 uh, or 868 of them in the country. So those people don't have access to those um, benefits. Uh, so they, those people really suffer a lot uh, without much help. And also the, um, the as I said, NGO and POs are um, facing difficulties due to mobilities and financial difficulty as well. And also provision of multilingual information uh, is still challenging because it's very difficult for municipalities and also even the national national government to keep up with the update information in different languages. So the Japanese government provides the information in 18 languages, which is, I think it's a big improvement um, for the last 10 years or so, but there's still some time lag. Um, and also, um, so, so what happened is that because there's some time lag, a lot of municipalities are trying to translate that information into several languages by themselves. But then some municipalities, municipalities can do it very quickly, others can't, uh, you know, depending on the, the, the amount of resources that they have. So there, there's some kind of um, discrepancy in terms of the provision of information. And some municipalities, because they don't have money, they don't have resources, they use Google Translator. And, that, and you know how accurate that is. And then sometimes it's, it's um, the accuracy can have to be um, compromised, even though this sort of generic information could be communicated, but still, um, that's really not perfect either. Um, and there are some different uh, translations by different municipalities that could, could uh, cause confusion sometimes. All right, so what's going to happen in post-COVID Japan? Um, some people, uh, actually a lot of people do argue that there will be more migrants um, who, who will be choosing Japan. Uh, Gracia Liu Fala, for example, in her um, latest book or the latest article, that particularly international students from Asia will choose Japan because of the future job opportunities, limited Asian anti-Asian uh, anti racism, and low tuition. Um, Japan, Japanese universities' tuitions are much lower than the tuitions in Australia um, or the US or UK. So a lot of people in Asia are also hit by COVID. And then a lot of middle-class families may are likely to choose sort of cheaper 
tuition, um, sort of low co lower cost uh, education, higher education for their kids. So they might, they are likely, they're like Gracia at least is like projecting that they will choose uh, Japan over other countries, particularly because more and more Japanese universities are offering um, the curriculums and programs in English. Okay, and the Japanese government will also boost migration due to accelerating population aging. And I know that the, um, they're really determined to increase the number of migrants because of the sort of st structural demographic um, situations um, uh, and then population aging is, is really severe. And so they are really trying to boost the number of specified skilled workers that they just created the new scheme um, two years ago. Um, and um, they, I think they're going to keep pushing for that. And the Japanese public is very, very um, supportive of migrants. Um, and that would really help facilitate further migration, I would uh, project. And my, uh, my, uh, my research partner and myself uh, recently conducted the, the data analysis. Um, and they, we found a very interesting finding. But like, let me, before that, I'll just tell you that the Japan is one of the most uh, supportive country for immigration. So the, uh, it's the second highest sort of supportiveness uh, for migration. Um, according to International Social Survey Program already in 2013. So it's very, Japanese people are quite supportive of migration now. I think it's really in contrast to a sort of stereotypical image of Japanese. And this one too, um, this is the latest one in 2020 data. And um, the, to the question, is it a good thing to have more migrants? You know, almost 70% of Japanese said is yes, it's a good thing. Now only 30%, oh, roughly 30% um, of them say it's not a good thing. So the majority of Japanese people do support. And the latest research um, published earlier this year also um, sort of verified that about 60% of Japanese uh, did support and migration. And, and we, my colleague, um, in Japan, that nationalism is really not linked to anti not necessarily always uh, linked to anti migrant sentiments, which is the case for many countries in the world. Uh, you know, like in many countries, nationalists or patriots are really trying to sort of uh, argue that the, my, our country is for our people, et cetera, et cetera. But interestingly, um, according to our data analysis, the nationalism in population decline areas in Japan was actually correlated with pro-migrant sentiments. You know, it's very contrary to our sort of typical image, right? So those people who love Japan and truly care about its long-term future support um, uh, it's long, uh, long, its long-term future, they support migration because it's one of the very few options left sustainability. Um, so we presented a new conceptual framework of structural economic nationalism, which refers to economic nationalism determined by democratic structures. So because of this, and because of persistent labor shortage in regional areas, we project that migration will continue to increase in post-COVID uh, post Japan. And this is the, um, the data that we got. So the higher the nationalism um, level than the perceived values of negative, con uh, negative uh, contribution of job, uh, migrants to Japan will e decrease. Um, so I'm gonna stop that. And yeah, that's it for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that um, excellent um, presentation and great to see all of that data there. Um, thank you so much. Um, moving on now, our next panelist um, I'm delighted to introduce is Dr. Yoko Ibuka, who is Professor of, of Economics at Keio University. And she works on a broad range of topics in the field of health economics, um, focusing on understanding health-related behavior and exploring um, effective public health policies. Um, so thank you, Professor Ibuka. Um, without further ado, I will pass over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for having me here today in Japan Update this year. And thank you everyone for participating. Um, um, I'm Yoko Ibuka, Health Economics at Keio University. We all know that the impact of COVID-19 is massive and therefore it's been affecting almost all dimensions of people's life. 
Today, I would like to talk about one of the very important public health concerns under the COVID-19 pandemic in Japan, which is suicide based on the published scientific articles. So recent studies show some alarming situation. Suicidal behavior has been increasing during COVID-19 pandemic worldwide. What is less clear now is suicide incidents as there is a, partly because there is a barrier to access to real-time data of suicide. Japanese government reports the number of suicides every month, and therefore an immediate update of suicide incidents is possible and has been done using Japanese data. Even before the pandemic, Japan was one of the countries with high suicide incidence rate among high-income countries in the Western Pacific area. It is well known that suicide is related to macroeconomic conditions. And as the policies mitigating COVID-19 have been disrupting economic activities so much, this would add to concerns regarding the situation in Japan. Uh, therefore, to understand how the pandemic have been affecting suicide is essential for further policy making regarding public health, social, and economic policies under COVID-19. Um, before I start talking about what has been shown about suicide in Japan, I would like to briefly touch upon the trajectory of COVID-19 in Japan from early 2020 up to now. So this figure is uh, the, the very similar to what Sawada-san shows in, in his talk. But, uh, this shows uh, COVID-19 new cases and accumulated deaths over time. As you see here, um, there have been five waves so far, um, and the state of emergency has been in place for four times in Tokyo area. Um, the concerns, uh, the content of intervention package differ, each, but in general, the state of emergency in Japan requests individuals to stay at home as much as possible without causing. Sorry, um, as much as possible without imposing any punishment in case of violation. At the same time, the government often requests bars and restaurants to close completely or close earlier or not to provide alcoholic beverages. Now, Tokyo is in the middle of the fifth wave um, due to the Delta variant and the current wave has been producing the greatest number of cases, as you see here, uh, but the intensity of the measures taken was the strongest in the first wave, uh, the first state of emergency in April last year. Um, regarding suicide in Japan so far, I have identified four studies which investigated suicide incidents under COVID-19 pandemic in Japan. Uh, those studies use the data up to fall 2020, last year, investigating the impact of the first and the second waves. Uh, two main results are consistent across these four studies. As for the trend, the suicide first decreased in April and May 2020 and started increasing after that. This may be uh, quite unexpected, However, uh, similar results are reported by a study regarding high income and upper middle income countries in the initial stage of pandemic. Also, it is known that there is a reduction in suicide after massive disasters such as hurricanes or earthquakes followed by an increase in suicide. In addition, some Japanese specific factors may have affected uh, the reduction in suicide. Specifically, uh, the initial stay at home order included school closure, and it also led to a reduction in working hours among adults. Knowing that in Japan, some suicides are related to long hour work, and suicides among children tend to increase, increase after long vacation, those factors may have further contributed to a reduction in suicide. Finally, 
Um, as Oishan mentioned, the government provided sort of generous cash benefits to all students to mitigate the economic impact of COVID-19, which may have helped as well. Another important finding is a difference in the impact by gender and age, specifically an increase in suicide among females is more pronounced than males. This is consistent with findings from earlier meta-analysis and review paper regarding suicidal behavior during COVID-19 from various countries. However, it shows a clear contrast to the impact reported in the context of past macroeconomic shocks where they tended to influence males more than females. And there are potential reasons why the impact is larger among females. Uh, those include worse economic situation due to a greater impact on female dominant industries, such as food service or hospitality industry, and increase in domestic violence during the state of emergency, and an increase in burden of working mothers to take care of children due to the stay-at-home order. Finally, as for the age difference, a study by Sakamoto and others investigated the impact by age group in details, and it shows that the impact was most pronounced among relatively young individuals. It is also important to understand the similarity or difference in the trend between suicide incidents and suicidal ideation or attempt. Based on the data of emergency dispatches associated with suicide till July 2020, uh, one study shows that, that suicide attempt was higher compared to the level in pre-pandemic years in the early stage of the pandemic. This study also showed that uh, the most affected population was females aged 25 to 40, 49 years. Um, a study based on an online survey provided an important information on individual characteristics of those who have suicidal ideation in the early phase of the pandemic. There was a small decline in suicidal ideation overall after the pandemic. However, those who reported suicidal ideation increased among those who did not report it before the pandemic. So this indicates um, those people became at risk after the pandemic started. Also, the study showed that individuals in their 30s, those with unstable employment status, those without children, and with relatively low income were more likely to report suicidal ideation after the pandemic started. Suicide is really caused by a single factor and various factors would be affecting people in a complex way under COVID-19. Um, literature so far discussed uh, such factors include health problems such as worry of being infected uh, or, and or being transmitted to others financial insecurity or loss of employment caused by the pandemic, burden of unpaid care work because of school closure and work from home, an increase in domestic violence, um, isolation feeling, uh, which um, led to impaired social and family relationship, and the disruption in receiving mental health care due to limited health care service access. So as the published literature so far has revealed the figures only by fall 2020, I tried to estimate a percent increase in suicide after fall 2020 using the publicly available aggregated 
aggregated data. So here in this figure, this number shows a change in comparison with the same month of the pre-pandemic period from 2017 to 2019. So, um, how to estimate this number is basically similar to what the literature has done. And you see um, there was a peak in October in 2020, and the increase in suicide lasted during 2020. And um, this is a uh, um, breakdown by gender, and you see uh, the impact uh, has lasted longer among the females, as you will see here. So to summarize, so far studies identified females and the young as being at higher risk of suicide worldwide, as well as in Japan. Also, in the impact of the pandemic on suicide has been changing over time. It is important to keep a close eye on inform when and where the COVID-19 affects suicide in the middle run and long run, and measures has to be taken at various healthcare levels for people at risk. At the same time, population-wide evidence-based public interventions should be implemented. Such interventions include the limitation of the access to the means of suicide, such as suicide-linked substance, a long, strong emphasis of media's role in minimizing the risk of imitative suicide. Finally, further research is needed to disentangle what economic and public health interventions mitigated the impact of COVID-19 on mental health of individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ibuka, for that really important um, presentation and for addressing what it, what is a very serious and important um, problem. It seems that um, not just in Japan, in many countries, including Australia, that there's just been so much focus on just curbing the immediate, um, you know, viral aspect of the pandemic. And although many governments have been aware of this shadow pandemic of mental health issues, they've been really lagging um, with addressing that. Um, and so I think your, the data you provided would, would be helpful for also the Australian government. Um, I'd now like to just um, offer, if, if Professor Sawada, would you like to um, make a few comments or come in on, on the two presentations before we move into the Q&A? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Roland. And also uh, thank you very much, uh, Oisang and Ibuka-san for really wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to make a few uh, comments um, on um, uh, Oisang's uh, presentation on migration. Uh, I learned a lot, and um, thank you very much for uh, providing us a very comprehensive profiling of uh, what happened uh, among the uh, migrants. Um, and um, um, uh, so uh, uh, my comments is uh, from uh, developing Asian angle, what happened to the um, uh, migrants and uh, more importantly, remittances flow uh, to uh, recipients and home uh, family. Um, actually, just before COVID-19, um, um, according to our uh, tracking, data tracking, remittances uh, inflow to Asia continuously uh, increased. And uh, around the 300 billion uh, in total, um, uh, that money is flowing into uh, Asian Pacific region. So this is like a record high. And um, um, uh, 300 billion, uh, which is uh, comparable to uh, tourism receipts, you, you know, tourist, tourists visiting Asia and spending money. That um, uh, total amount is about uh, 300 billion, so same. And um, also another very important uh, source of uh, uh, financial inflow to Asia, which is FDI, foreign direct investment. And um, net foreign direct investment inflow um, uh, to Asia before COVID-19 is about um, 550 or so. So FDI, uh, people, you know, in general, we understand FDI is a really uh, key driver of Asian development uh, right now. But actually, in terms of our financial inflows, um, um, uh, about half of our FDI inflow 
we are getting money through uh, migrants um, uh, remittance uh, sending money uh, back. So naturally, uh, how COVID-19 and the border control affected um, uh, uh, migrants inflow and also remittance inflow. And um, uh, actually, um, um, uh, early stages of pandemic, uh, World Bank uh, made an uh, estimate, probably um, uh, remittance will collapse and 20% decline uh, in 2020. Um, but looking back, um, actually what happened in 2020 uh, this uh, collapse in uh, remittance info didn't happen. Actually, uh, according to our tracking data, uh, developing Asia, uh, total amount of remittances were rather slightly increased, 1.4% increase, or almost uh, stable. So actually, this is a bit uh, supplies and um, uh, somewhat um, uh, good supplies. Uh, pro it's maybe somewhat similar to what you described. Migrant situation seems to be better uh, than uh, uh, our prior expectation uh, from the, this uh, aspect, uh, a wide um, uh, range of uh, challenges. And um, for Asia, developing Asia, why uh, 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 remittance inflow uh, didn't collapse? So there are multiple reasons. Although senders um, have a hardship in Europe or uh, uh, developed economy and high income economies, but uh, in general, uh, remittance inflow uh, is characterized by counter cyclical behavior. So, home country suffering from uh, hardship then uh, uh, increase. So, definitely, is a counter cyclicality, cyclicality play a role. And also, um, uh, uh, increased saving, uh, consumption, and travel options are limited. So, uh, migrants seem to save money and send back. And also, uh, because they cannot uh, bring money home, uh, they tended to use the uh, official channel, um, uh, you know, Western Union or uh, some bank channel. So some data uh, 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 artificially increased. Uh, but uh, more importantly, we see observe some country-specific uh, elements. For example, Bangladesh, Pakistan, particularly we saw uh, remittance in inflow increase. And, um, uh, this can be attributed to so-called Haji effect. So now um, many migrants, uh, workers in Gulf countries uh, could not do the Haji uh, in uh, July and August. So rather than you know, spending money, uh, they started sending. Uh, that seems to be um, uh, uh, one channel, especially uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And uh, Pakistan actually um, expectedly or unexpectedly, I don't know, exactly but um, uh, they put some uh, tax uh, exemption uh, framework to facilitate more uh, remittance inflow that can stimulate more incentivize more remittance flow so i think these are the uh, really interesting uh, uh, observations so i was wondering if you have some um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, some findings around the remittance uh, flow of um, uh, uh, you know migrants uh, related to uh, Japan, so so that's a ma my one uh, uh, bigger comment, if I may, or question, if I may. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sawada, for those um, very interesting remarks. Um, I will give um, Dr. Oishi a chance to respond, and I will also just pick up two questions um, for Professor Oishi from. Um, our audience, and one is um, the the, issue, the matter of naturalization is very low in Japan. Do you expect there will be you know, some more um, public debate on this at some point? And another question um, is when you're discussing when when you were talking about the the fairly high degree of public acceptance of migration in Japan is. Is there, can we distinguish between acceptance of permanent um, foreign workers or is this just an acceptance of temporary workers? How, how do Japanese people feel about, um, yeah, these two kind of categories? Okay, thank you, thank you very much for great questions. And first of all, I'd like to really thank um, Professor Sawada for very, very important information. I used to work for the ILO. I worked with people in ADB before, and um, I was really actually in, in charge of remittance issues as well. So like, this is like really core to my heart. So I'm really glad that you addressed that. Um, 
Actually, well, for me, for this time, I still haven't been able to conduct um, research on remittance uh, situations in Japan. I've, I've been talking to people like entrepreneurs, and then they're actually making quite a bit of money from the, um, the tourism industry, even under COVID, um, partly because of the, uh, the benefits that the government has been offering. But to what extent they're remitting that money back home, it's really not, uh, uh, that's something that I really need to do more serious research on. So i um, sorry that I can't really answer that question at this point. Um, but I, I will definitely keep an eye on that. That's, and it, I was quite in, um, uh, intrigued by the fact that the remittances didn't collapse in Asia. That's extremely interesting. I actually would like to, I, I hope to talk to you a little bit more about it later on after, after the, the uh, Japan update. But anyway, uh, answering the second question about, uh, well, there, there are two questions. The low, about the not low naturalization, um, I don't think uh, the rate of uh, naturalization, I don't think it's going to increase in the near future because Japan doesn't really allow dual citizenship or multiple citizenship. So if they do, then I think naturalization rate will increase. But um, for anyone to naturalize, um, then they have to give up their um, um, citizenship uh, country uh, of the country of origin. And I think a lot of people hesitate to do that. So um, I don't think that um, naturalization rate is not going to increase rapidly even in the future. Um, and it's really easy to get permanent resident status in Japan. And um, it's not going to make a huge difference between permanent residency, permanent residence and naturalization in terms of benefits. So uh, that's my answer. The second question about the acceptance um, towards temporary migrants versus permanent migrants. Um, if you live in any countries, it's really hard to distinguish or differentiate you know, who are temporary migrants, who are permanent migrants. I mean, it's really hard to judge for anyone, right? So like whenever this, the, these surveys are conducted, they don't differentiate the categories of um, temporary migrants and permanent migrants. They lump them together. So the migrants as a whole group, they do research on a survey on. So um, I, don't, I don't, and I really don't think that would make a big difference. But at least when, as far as I know, um, migrants, whether they're temporary or te um, permanent, and they're really fully accepted as, um, as full members of community is in many uh, regional areas these days. That has been a big change in Japan. And they, 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 they used to be kind of excluded uh, from various um, communities, but they, they are getting more integrated because of the severe population aging and people are willing to accept them and uh, embrace them as community members. That's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And I just have one more question for um, Oishi. Um, San, it's about the link between nationalism and support for migration. Um, um, have you found any differences in the level of support according to residency status or type of migrant? For example, migrant worker versus asylum seeker. Okay, well, asylum, uh, you I, I'm sorry, like I'm not really quite sure about the question. Um, the level of support from who? Um, in J Japanese society, again, society. there's a kind of difference um, between, you know, say migrant workers versus asylum seekers, uh, those kind of categories, you know, support. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, like asylum seekers who apply community members but the, again, you know the local people are asylum seekers who are not who are temporary migrants who are permanent it's really difficult so it has a side has they're trying to em embrace those migrants uh, no matter who they are and uh, particularly local municipalities don't differentiate them in terms of providing support uh, financial assistance and so forth, social service, providing social services. Um, although I would say that this asylum seeker in terms of sort of social support because they, well, their asylum applications have been rejected and then staying in Japan, then that will be a different story. Then they won't be uh, registered on the municipal residential list. That means that they have no access to official, officially speaking, they have no access to, to various public support. So, um, so whether in Japan, whether you are on the residential list or not, residence list, jumin toroku, um, or not, you know, that's, that's, that makes a huge difference. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, your sound was breaking up a little bit, um, but oh, I think it's okay. we can still hear you, no worries. And I'd just like to direct a question um, to Professor Ibuka. Um, it was interesting how you mentioned this kind of being different waves of, you know, I guess you could say groups um, who are vulnerable to suicide as the pandemic has kind of evolved in Japan. And sort of some latest um, news articles I've read have said that school children are now a really concerning category. And that's something that we're, we're seeing in, um, in Australia as well, that the mental health challenge is there. So, yeah, I'm wondering if you could kind of forecast as the, the pandemic sort of continues to evolve in Japan, will the, the sort of public health policy be directed at, you know, these kind of different categories? Or if you could um, comment on that, that would be great. Thank you very much for the um, very good question. So, of course, uh, it's very hard to forecast, you know, in the future. But um, if based on those studies which have become available so far, you know, we see uh, there is no direct correlation between number of COVID cases, so the you know degree of the pandemic and the suicide incidents. So um, we may. Um, uh, be a bit worried about some kind of time lag between um, the COVID situation and uh, the suicide incidents. And in particular, um, at this moment, the government uh, has been uh, providing the economic packages, uh, including business support package and individual cash benefits and those things. And some of those economic packages will expire sometime uh, in the not very far from now. So, so I, I, I'm um, myself I'm worried about the impact of uh, such termination of those economic stimulus packages on the mental health of individuals, because um, in Japan. Uh, especially the macroeconomic conditions and also the people's employment status and uh, suicide incidents are highly correlated. So that is what uh, I think. Uh, and also for the uh, difference by population, uh, you mentioned the effects on children. And of course, that is um, um, additional worries at this moment. Because of the uh, Delta variation, Delta variant, um, the, at this moment, the, some of the schools still close and the school closure um, may have some impact after the school closure terminated. So, you know, uh, careful intervention would be necessary uh, for the transition period from uh, school closure to the normal, you know, school lives. So, yes, that is what I think. Thank you. Okay, um, excellent points. Yeah, and also in Australia, we're kind of struggling, and I think many countries, including Japan, we're trying to find the balance between, you know, protecting people from the actual virus and also managing the increasing mental health toll. Increasingly, there's calls in Australia to you know, open up schools and just find a way to, you know, let children go back to schools, which is seen as really important for their mental health. Um, I'd just like to hand over to Professor Sawada once more, who wants to comment on Professor Ibuka's um, paper. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to make um, uh, quick uh, comments um, um, uh, on the Ibuka-san's presentation. Uh, so I think you can see my slide, I hope. Or oh, let me see. Not yet, we can't see it yet. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to mention uh, this is a very important issue and um, uh, lots of the media uh, uh, put that uh, big attention to uh, suicide issues in Japan after COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic. Uh, but I'd like to mention uh, there is a, some long-term um, uh, very important uh, elements uh, on this um, uh, uh, COVID-19 driven uh, suicide increase in Japan. Um, this is the um, uh, uh, one slide from my uh, uh, book uh, we published um, uh, four or five years ago. Um, so this covers up until 2014, since uh, 1989. 
Um, Japan suicide increased uh, 97 to 98 when uh, financial crisis hit um, uh, Japanese economy. At that time, uh, we saw uh, jump is driven by a middle-aged uh, male, unemployed or economically uh, troubled self-employed people. And then um, uh, since uh, 98, uh, about 10 years, there is uh, some uh, continued um, uh, suicide um, uh, numbers and trend. Um, um, total number uh, remain over uh, 30,000 uh, over 10 years. But uh, in ingredients, actually age shift from older cohort to younger cohort. So younger people suicide increase. So this has been a suicide issue has been a really chronic um, uh, vexing uh, problem in Japan and Japanese uh, society. Uh, government uh, set the basic law, uh, suicide prevention, uh, 2006. Um, uh, then uh, situation started um, uh, changing, uh, continuous decline, especially suicide prevention fund and the government fund, um, um, uh, sizable fund has been allocated. And also uh, 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 municipalities, Shiku uh, Chosong started um, setting a suicide prevention offices and uh, started doing a lot of um, uh, uh, innovative program to prevent suicide. So we uh, started seeing a decline since uh, 2008 up until 2019. So we, we observe uh, this has been a successful uh, case of government policy and government budget and local government uh, supporting. Uh, but as uh, Ibuka san said, uh, this uh, uh, trend, continuous uh, declining trend of successful uh, suicide uh, control rebutted, just rebutted. And um, um, uh, in fact, the first wave, um, uh, February, January, uh, July, um, suicide didn't increase, but uh, as uh, Ibuka san showed in one of the uh, slides, uh, second wave, uh, July, o October, uh, suddenly um, uh, suicide started increasing. Uh, and um, um, also, Ibuka san uh, mentioned that Tanaka san's uh, and Okamoto san's uh, nature human behavior article. I think that's a very good article using, uh, you know, because, because of this uh, suicide prevention, government started uh, releasing monthly data. Uh, at the Shikchoson level, monthly data uh, on suicide. That helped a lot. And um, uh, Tanaka Okamoto Nature Human Behavior paper used this uh, very granular Shikchoson level panel data to perform a difference in difference uh, type of uh, assessment of uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And they clearly found um, uh, uh, suicide increase among the uh, 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 women and also younger uh, population. I think this is really Annoying because uh, and also Okamoto uh, paper uh, showed that uh, uh, Shikucho Song, who has been um, uh, successful in controlling suicide and suicide numbers uh, declining, that kind of Shikucho Song encounter uh, increase in suicide. And uh, also women and younger uh, people, uh, uh, we observe a big uh, suicide. And uh, Although Tanaka Okamoto analysis stopped in October last year, but Ibuka's analysis seems to show even after second wave, October 2020, this trend continues. So I think uh, this is really a big challenge uh, governments and also societies facing. Uh, governments should uh, really uh, uh, design and uh, adapt, uh, 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 customize or targeted uh, uh, suicide prevention policies. And also broader society, I think we face this a uh, big challenge of uh, uh, COVID and uh, stay home um, uh, uh, driven a mental stress. Um, uh, so one question, one further comment. One comment is um, uh, actually ADB, we started using a Twitter, uh, uh, big data uh, to, uh, because uh, we need to capture real time uh, uh, psychosocial situation of population. So in order to do that, we started using uh, 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 Twitter and disparing and decoding by uh, uh, machine learning. So I think this uh, may be uh, one uh, uh, useful way uh, how to, in order to set the evidence-based policy um, instruments. I think uh, granular data is inf important. So Twitter or uh, social media or other uh, new type of data can be uh, 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 crafted. And uh, the other thing is, uh, because <laughs> this is a broader question. So I saw this is very important area of research. And uh, I was wondering uh, about your uh, research plan. Uh, you continue to do this uh, you know, analysis of suicide uh, prevention um, uh, uh, research. And uh, what, what's your plan? If you can share some of your thoughts about this. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Sawara. It was great to get that pre-pandemic um, context with the, with the data. Um, Professor Ibuka, I'd like to let you respond. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so just a quick um, reply to Professor Savada's comment. And thank you very much for uh, providing me the very useful information before the uh, COVID pandemic and what the government has been done in these areas. And as for your question regarding my future research plan, um, yes, um, yes. At, at this moment, actually, I started working on the issues in on DV, domestic, domestic violence, with one of my colleagues, because that is, I think, um, one of the uh, very important factors which would be related to the um, female uh, mental health status. So, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you um, to all of our, our panelists. It's been a fantastic discussion and I think everyone would have really enjoyed the, the rich you know, data and analysis that you've presented to us in helping us to understand what the really um, troubling um, social impact of the coronavirus um, pandemic is on Japan. Um, so thank you so much for your time and, and for joining us today. And also thank you to the audience for your great questions. Uh, we're now going to have a lunch break and we're gonna reconvene at 12.30 for a panel on science, defense and technology in Japan. So hope to see you all back then. Thank you. <laughs>